la bestialidad imperialista. Bestialidad que no tiene una frontera determinada ni pertenece a un país determinado. Bestias fueron las hordas hitleristas, como bestias son los norteamericanos hoy, como bestias son los paracaidistas belgas, como bestias fueron los imperialistas franceses en Argelia. Porque es la naturaleza del imperialismo la que bestializa a los hombres, la que la convierte en fieras sedientas de sangre que están dispuestas a degollar, a asesinar, a destruir hasta la última imagen de un revolucionario, de un partidario de un régimen que haya caído bajo su bota o que luche por su libertad. Y la estatua que recuerda a Lumumba, hoy destruida pero mañana reconstruida, nos recuerda también en la historia trágica de ese mártir de la revolución del mundo, que no se puede confiar en el imperialismo, pero ni tantito así, nada. What's good, everybody? Welcome to episode 18, Unmasking Imperialism, Exposing Imperialist Propaganda in Mainstream Media. Today, an eyewitness view, a revolutionary view of Bolivarian Venezuela. Shout out to all of our sisters and brothers in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. It's hot as fuck today. I'm in LA. It's like close to 100 degrees, but we're chilling. We're still out here having a good time, having a good convo. And uh, joining us today is my good comrade, my homie, the real Mr. Worldwide. That's my new nickname for him, the real Mr. Worldwide, because this dude is always traveling and not in a bourgeois travel way. This guy's traveling for revolutionary work, revolutionary organizing. My homie, Yamir, a Colombian activist based in New York City in Queens. Shout out to Queens, that's my hometown. Uh, Yamir recently traveled to Venezuela to participate in the Bicentennial Congress of the Peoples of the World. The Congress was held on the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Carabobo, which we'll get into later, in which Venezuelan General Simón Bolívar defeated Spanish royalist forces. The battle took place on June 24th, 1821, 200 years ago eventually leading to the independence of Venezuela, inspiring revolutions across Latin America and the Caribbean. The Battle of Carabobo continues to inspire the country's Bolivarian revolution, and that's exactly what we're gonna be talking about today in Iwin's view of Bolivarian Venezuela with the homie, the comrade, Yamir. How's it going, brother? It's going good, homie. Feels good to be back on uh, Unmasking Imperialism. Uh, having this conversation from uh, coast to coast with a Latin brother from the East Coast to a Latin brother in the West Coast. And I'm uh, happy and glad to get into the discussion about the bicentennial of the Battle of Carabobo and my time in, in Venezuela. No doubt, man. Yeah, it's hot as fuck out here. I have my uh, seltzer water being very Caucasian today. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got to check but, uh, I got I to gotta show my jacket. Look. That's a fresh jacket. Where'd you get that jacket, actually? Over there in Venezuela, over there in You Canada. got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what's up, man. That's cool. I want to get a jacket like that, too. I think it's important to rock revolutionary gear and swag. I got my Che Guevara shirt on, uh, repping the Cuban Revolution and Latin America and the Caribbean. Shout out to compañera Erica, to Debra Rodriguez, to Salifu. Salifu said, uh, we can't let them, on, let them own seltzer. I know. That shit is bomb, though. I do fucks with seltzer water. But anyway, today we're going to be talking about Venezuela, a revolutionary view of the Bolivarian Republic. You were just there a few days ago, and it's really exciting. When you were there, you were sending me all the videos and the pics, and I was like, damn, I wish I was there. We were both in uh, Nicaragua a few months ago, and it's cool that you were able to go to Venezuela. You've also been to Cuba, which is dope, so you've completed your uh, trek of resistance tour several times now, I think. And um, before we get into talking about your experience in Venezuela, why don't you give us just a brief background on what is the Battle of Carabobo and Simón Bolívar? What is the importance and the legacy of Simón Bolívar? Because again, right, 
you went for the second uh, 200th anniversary of the Battle of Carabobo for the Bolivar and Republic of Venezuela, Simon Bolivar. Give us a, a rundown of who is Bolivar and what is the Battle of Carabobo? So Simon Bolivar is a um, Venezuelan. Well, he was born in Venezuela, but he's seen as a great Latin American revolutionary that led a lot of the independence struggles, not just in Venezuela, but also in Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. So um, this year marks the bicentennial, the 200 years of the victory of the Battle of Carabobo, where General Simón Bolívar led an army of farmers, of indigenous people, of Afro-descendant people, women, against the Spanish crown, and therefore consolidated the independence of Venezuela. But to keep like uh, everything in its historical context, to contextualize it correctly, this was the third attempt of Venezuelan uh, independence because they already tried to do it twice and um, and failed. Like this is very important to understand this because um, right after the second time, I believe, when Bolivar loses Venezuela, he's exiled to the Caribbean and he goes to Jamaica. And, and it's in Jamaica where he writes this document called La Carta de Jamaica, the letter of Jamaica, where he's writing about the unity of, of Latin America or how Latin America should unify, which therefore would bring the idea of La Gran Colombia, the, the, the Grand Colombia. But all of that was in, um, was in reaction to the Monroe Doctrine. As you know, the Monroe Doctrine passed by the US President James Monroe who said that uh, America for the Americans in saying that the Euro Europeans should not encroach any more in the Americas because when the Spanish crown was falling, you had the imperialists of Napoleon Bonaparte in France that wanted to invade the, the continent of the Americas and the US enacts the Monroe Doctrine and Bolivar sees the Monroe Doctrine as the United States wanting to become an empire and treating us Latin Americans as their backyard. That's why he comes up with the famous quote, um, the United States is destined by province to plague the Americas with hunger and misery in the name of freedom. So all of this brings into a lot of context as well as him going to Haiti where he gets help by the Haitians to go to Colombia, to Venezuela, to liberate these territories as like and, and the deal was also to free the slaves within south america so when bolivar goes back to venezuela after being exiled um he leads for a third time this independence struggle and it's not just him but also you have a uh, what they call a llanero or like more like a farmer from the plain area antonio de la paz and also um this afro descendant leader named Pedro Cam Camacho, that they name, they know him as El Negro Primero, the, the, the frontline Negro, I mean, to, to translate it. Um, so they are victorious on June 24th, 1821. And this victory marks the independence, not just for Venezuela, but for the continent, because they don't just stop in Venezuela, they go all over the Andes. They go to Colombia, where they have the Battle of Boyacá, they go to Ecuador, where they have the Battle of Pinchincha, to Peru with the Battle of Ayacucho, and Bolivia with the Battle of Junín. So the, these, this battle is very important within the resistance of our history in Latin America. This is why it's important for us to celebrate and to commemorate the 200 years of um, Simón Bolívar, El Libertador, um, grand, grand victory against the Spanish crown. Yeah, for sure, man. That's I think that's such a great historical breakdown. And I actually first learned about Bolivar in 20, 2009, 2010, around the time that Hugo Chavez was on the news almost every day. And also through my fraternity, Fiota Alpha. Shout out to Fio, any Fiotas watching and listening. By the way, we consider ourselves, Simon Bolivar is one of our pillars. And he represents Latin American unity, Latin American integration at a time when that was seen as revolutionary. You talk about Latin American unity and integration today, 
to some people on the left, it doesn't seem that radical, but in the 1800s, in the context of what you're talking about, the Monroe Doctrine, that was extremely rebellious, extremely revolutionary, because the Spanish had just finished colonizing Latin America and the Caribbean, and they fragmented the region into little balkanized pieces. The best way to control colonies, right, divide and conquer, the U.S. sure as fuck did not want to see a United States of Latin America. Bolivar was one of the people who was introducing that concept, spreading that concept. And I, I have to add as well that his idea, not only was it inspired uh, in large part as well by the Haitian Revolution, you know, shout out to the people of Haiti. I mean, the Haitian without the Haitian people, there would be no Latin American revolutions, quote unquote, independence movements for all of their faults. Right? We know they're not that Latin America is still not 100% free, but even if the, the flag of Venezuela, that blue and red two stripes at the bottom is in, in homage to Haiti's flag. If you look at the flag of Haiti, it's blue and red and the gold on the top represents a continuation of that struggle uh, of independence. And Bolivar also inspired many other independence heroes around Latin America and the Caribbean. We can talk about Francisco Morazan in Central America, who was also in the same lodge La Logia Lautaro, which is a, a, a Lautaro named after a uh, Mapuche indigenous activist from Chile, who Bolivar was inspired by. It was a Masonic Lodge where they organized the independence movement against the Spanish. He also influenced Jose Martí in Cuba. He influenced Sandino in Nicaragua. I got the, the flag of the Frente Sandinista right here. Sandino says directly that his struggle, his guerrilla movement against the Yankee imperialists was inspired by Bolivar. He was continuing that because he understood that Bolivar's vision was a united Latin America and the Caribbean that could face off against the U.S. And so I'm glad you gave that context. Before we go into talking about the bicentennial, why don't you give us, obviously, you know, both of us as people who recognize and honor Bolivar, right? Nobody is perfect. Everyone has their flaws. People are human beings. There's good and bad things. Why don't you give us a perspective or controvert uh, a rundown of some of the debates on the left because there seems to be this wing within the the left i would say more the ultra left that demonizes bolivar that that downplays these historical events because they're not radical enough or revolutionary enough what's your response and reaction to people who just want to cancel and do away with bolivar so um yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of run-ins with like people with this ultra left positions, uh, like Latin Americans, especially uh, Colombians, ah, me, me being Colombian American, um, that kind of want to cancel Bolivar because they want to apply the way we view social justice nowadays. They don't want to like contextualize those times. Like um, I remember when I had a rally one time in New York City in solidarity of Colombia. And we had to uh, march from Grand Central all the way to the statue of Bolivar in Central Park. You had these um, sisters, um, you know, say these like bad, horrible chants against Bolivar, you know, calling him like, you know, a, a violador, a rapist. And people were looking at them like like it was crazy, you know? And, and, and for me, it was like, you know, you could have your, your views on a historical figure, like, Nobody's perfect. Like, you know, Che Guevara is not perfect. Uh, Fidel, Tupac Amaru, all, all these people have their flaws, but you're not going to cancel them out of history because they symbolize our people's self-determination. They symbolize our people's resistance. They symbolize our people's liberation. Um, the, 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 liberate, the, the resistance and the liberation in Latin America doesn't begin with Bolivar and doesn't end with Bolivar, but Bolivar is an important role within that resistance of our continent, where he carries he carries the, the resistance of Tupac Amaru, Tupac Atari, and, and it goes towards him, where he is successfully able to get the Spaniards out of our continent and able to create these nation states that now we hold dear to us, that now we have pride and 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 um like uh my bad, I'm trying to get my, my words together. But yeah, anyways, <laughs> I can share with you an experience I had. Uh, when I went to this communal council, this feminist communal council, and I told this story about Bolivar to these feminists, and they told me about how um, they re revindicate Bolivar as a liberator. And um, due to the Bolivarian revolution, 
and due to the them um, using Bolivar as this image of sovereignty, of Latin American unity, and of anti-imperialism, they've been able to rescue women revolutionary leaders of those times, like Manuelita Sainz, who was his his um well his his love interest, but also he he uh, promoted her to a rank of military general, which was big for those times. Manuelita Sainz was a Ecuadorian woman. Um, there was also other other women leaders that the Bolivarian Revolution have been able to to save. Um, so, given the fact that yes, I mean, there's this debate on on the left about trying to cancel Bolivar, but the fact is, um, there's so much I can say. But I, <laughs> I also want to say too. I also want to say like a couple more things, like because the fact too, I, I was in Colombia too. I was in the the um, place where Bolivar died. He died, the thing to the contextualizing history too is that he died poor, he died betrayed. He died with people stabbing him in the back, whether it was pa pa Paulo de, de Santander, Francisco Paulo de Santander, or wh whether it was Antonio de la Paz in Venezuela. Santander was a Colombian general. Sa uh, Paz was a Venezuelan general. And, and Santander betrayed Bolivar because he was jealous of Bolivar, of him leading La Gran Colombia initiative the Gran Colombia project against the United States and against Europe and b betrayed him and had him exiled. And Antonio de la Paz um, didn't allow him to go back to Venezuela. And unfortunately he had to die in somebody else's house in Santa Marta with no money. Yeah, no, he lost all his wealth after, after the independence struggle. Um, so, and, and, and it shows that, Bolivar's dream of a unified Latin America, it's carried today with the Bolivarian Revolution and with what uh, Comandante Hugo Chavez was able to plant within the Venezuelan people. I, also, I would also like to add too, and I'll probably be one of the first ones to ever say this. I hope I'm one of the first ones to say this too. But there's a lot of people that you we, we always call them race reductionists that want to cancel Bolivar because he was a so-called Creole, so-called they say he was a white guy that came from a a uh, prestigious like slaveocracy background, but he freed he freed his slaves and he gave up that wealth. But in Venezuela, there's also an argument that he could have been mestizo, he could have been of, of mixed race, and it shows with the new image that Chavez, Comandante Chavez, made of Bolivar, where he took his remains out of his tomb and had Russian scientists scan his his bones, and it showed an image of a of of, of um, a racially mixed man that Bolivar looked like almost he almost looked like me. He almost looked like a, a, a mestizo. And that was an image that the Venezuelan opposition, the racist Venezuelan opposition, hated and they took took it out of the National Assembly when they had control of the National Assembly in 2016. So I want I want to say that for me, Bolivar is my forefather. For me as a Colombian American born in the diaspora, I will always lift the name of lift the image and the memory of Bolivar, because what Bolivar did for the continent, for, for the people of Latin America, whether it's Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, was convert us from the oppressed people of the Spanish empire, the Spanish crown, into liberators of our continent, into libertadores, libertadoras. And that is what Chavez, Hugo Chavez was able to wake up within the Venezuelan masses. That's what's up, man, going off. That's what's up, comrade Yamid. It's always mad dope to talk to you and hear from you because I think that's exactly a solid Marxist perspective and analysis. So many people who call themselves Marxists and communists treat Marxism like a religion. Good people, bad people, revolutionary, non-revolutionary. And that's not the way that Marxists should be thinking. Marxists understand reality dialectically. Things undergo a process you have somebody like Fidel Castro, who didn't start off as a communist, was a petty bourgeois, a nationalist, lawyer, came from a wealthy white Cuban family, became one of the most important Marxist-Leninists in human history. And the same with Che Guevara as well, the same with so many other revolutionaries throughout history who have undergone a dialectical process. And we can apply that same Marxist analysis to Bolivar, where he started off from a wealthier background, from more bourgeois background, more elite, but then he betrayed his racist class, his 
corp or his bourgeois interests in favor of the people, in favor of liberation movements around the continent, as far as Bolivia and influencing movements all around the hemisphere and the world. And I think that's the right approach, understanding that not everyone's going to be 100% revolutionary from the beginning. Nobody is perfect. Uh, shout out to everybody watching and listening, by the way. Orlando said, dope history, love the conversation. That's what's up, Orlando. Shout out to comrade Erica. She said, I will continue to blame postmodernism. Post that's exactly right, comrade Erica. And that's why the CIA has promoted a lot of ultra-left thinking and wanting to cancel everything. Everyone is bad. Everyone is horrible. You should never defend anybody. The CIA likes that because when you do that, you don't look to the, your historical background, to your people, to find inspiration from what they're what they've done and apply it to today. And so that's exactly po that postmodern view of canceling everyone and, and be, being puritanical in how you support figures is definitely a CIA back operation. And uh, we have some other comrades. Uh, Eric also mentioned the Bolivarian revolution is African. Yes, indeed. The African and indigenous peoples of Nuestra America, Abiyala, were the ones who are at the forefront of this revolution. Shout out to Isai, greetings from Venezuela, dear brother Yamid. That's what's up. That's probably one of your homies you probably, or comrades. You probably have some amazing stories. Um, but anyway, shout out to Cristina, by the way, who's watching and listening. Um, I think it's you made so many good points, man. And I want to move forward. Uh, shout out to Comrade Joseph as well. Uh, I want to move forward to this amazing video. You sent me this video of Maduro announcing the bicentennial a few days ago. I watched it, it gave me goosebumps. It's such a dope uh, video where he talks about, um, you know, announcing the Congress, right? And again, this is the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Carabobo, the Bicentennial, the Congress of the Peoples, uh, the Congress of Los Pueblos del Mundo, of all people, not just Latin American and Caribbean people, but people all over the world from oppressed nations. And you said something to me, Amit, that really stood out to me when you sent me this, that it really signifies the central role, the core role of Venezuela in the anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist movement today, where you have meetings of revolutionaries from Africa, Asia, and Latin America, the most oppressed by colonialism, capitalism, and imperialism, meeting in Venezuela, organizing, coming together, internationalism. And I think that's something that's very beautiful, that international proletarian solidarity. And, and this video is a good example of that. So I, I wanna play this video I want to translate uh, to English for those of you who are listening to this as a podcast and for those of you who don't speak Spanish. So I'm, I'm going to play this, translate some of it. And it's just such a such a dope video uh, coming out of Venezuela. <laughs> We are organizing here in Venezuela from June 21st to 24th, the Congress, Bicentennial Congress of the Peoples of the World, to all the leaders, women leaders of all the social movements of the world, to make a huge gathering for liberty, a huge meeting for the unity of the peoples, in homage to Carabobo, in homage to Simón Bolívar, bring their flags with force for independence, for auto-determination, sovereignty, for liberty, for equality, for truth, the struggle for a new society. We wait for you here, all, everybody. This Venezuela stands forward against the empires of the world. This Venezuela opens its heart to the world from all the struggles we've overcome to celebrate with you for the Battle of Carabobo. The Battle of Carabobo is today. And now they're singing El Pueblo Unido, the people united will never be defeated. Bicentennial Congress of the People. So that's a dope ass video. You sent me that. I was like, damn, I wish I would have gone with you. I should have snuck into your suitcase or something. 
but uh it looks so dope man from everything that you sent me and and all the pics and videos and by the way in a little bit we'll go into some sharing some of the pics that uh, comrade yamir took while he was over there and he can give us some background on on what his experience was give us a rundown of the conference like how like how you ended up going just an overview of it and and your general experience yeah, so I ended up going to this conference because I am uh, plugged in to like to the youth out in Venezuela to the JPUSV, uh, Juventud Partido Unida, uh, wait, the JPUS, the Juventud Partido Socialista Unida de Venezuela. Um, so they invited me to this this uh, congress because I went to Venezuela two years ago. This is my second time in Venezuela. Um, I went to for for a, a university student uh, conference, and that's where I've gotten. I was able to build with the youth out there, and they were able to invite me to this. Uh, them seeing, knowing me uh, on social media, seeing the the type of work I involve myself in, and how I'm always in solidarity with Venezuela because I have that pan Latin Americanist analysis of understanding how Venezuela is the cradle of my of my forefather, my liberator, Simon Bolivar. So it, it was a, a honor being a, a Colombian American and knowing what my motherland, Matria, Colombia is going through right now, given the fact that they're being oppressed by a US backed narco fascist regime of Ivan Duque and Alvaro Uribe, that for me it was a it was a grand it was a grand honor. Also the fact given the fact that like I, I have a I have a my my father was was an ex-guerrilla fighter too, and he always implanted Bolivar and Chavez with within me so um yeah like I, it was it was just if i felt i felt the moment there it was it was just so it was so beautiful to be in venezuela and given the fact that like venezuela right now is the epicenter of the anti-imperialist anti-colonial struggle worldwide and they're they're not dogmatic whatsoever like they're trying to figure out what's the best way to unify the oppressed of the world and try to create a front line a unified front line against imperialism. So for, for me to be there and for me to understand, like, like, like this, is, this is a genius of Comandante Chavez. He was able to figure out how to connect the battle, the independence movement of Carabobo to today, to how that relates to today, because Carabobo is today, because people right now are fighting for their independence. They're fighting for, for their freedom, for their self-determination. And the liberator, Simon Bolivar said that we have to try to consolidate the happiness of the people. And that's one thing that we all today are trying to consolidate within, within our popular movements. So for me to, to be there and to see the, the to, to celebrate the independence of Carabobo, I understand how now, due to the fact that it was able to consolidate Venezuela as a sovereign nation state, and Comandante Chavez was able to make Venezuela international, internationalize the struggle, internationalize the image of Simón Bolívar. It, it just gave me this, this more of a sense of Bolivarianism and helped me understand the significance of the Bolivarian Revolution and of Comandante Hugo Chavez Frías. That's what's up, comrade. It's good to hear that. And it's always energizing because living in Babylon, in the belly of the beast, in the core imperialist United States, it can be depressing sometimes. <laughs> Not going to lie. You know, you're living in capitalist society. People are distracted with mainstream media. They're distracted with nonsense. And so there's still a lot of issues. Don't get me wrong but just the level of class consciousness in the United States compared to Venezuela or Nicaragua or Cuba or Bolivia or any of our countries like is so lower compared to that. And it's something that when you go to an event like this, when you're around other like-minded revolutionaries, when you're around constructive oriented socialists and communists, you get positive energy, you get positive feedback. A lot of times, my experience, like for me personally, like I've had this experience with a lot of parties and groups, like it's always based on what people are against and negative and ego and just drama and unnecessary nonsense. But when you're around people like in Venezuela, I'm sure there were several moments where you literally, the hairs on your arm were literally sticking up from the electrical charge that you got from being around other people. When you're in a room and you're all chanting, you know, El Pueblo Unido or 
La Espada de Bolívar por América Latina, that kind of stuff. Like you get an energy from that. And I think that's what a lot of the left in the U.S. is missing is like not being afraid to defend historical figures like Bolívar, not being afraid to have the same jackets, to like have a culture, to have traditions. Because I think like so much of the first world left is so much focused on like destructing, deconstructing, destroying and not building. And so I, I think hearing what you're saying is, is so inspiring and, and revolutionary. I want to share this uh, really dope pic that you sent me. This is from your visit to Bolívar's, uh, to sorry, to Hugo Chavez's uh, monument. Why don't you give us, for those of you who are listening to this as a podcast, by the way, this is our very own comrade Yamir with the, the fresh shirt, the fresh shoes, the Venezuela hat with the 4F, with the fist up. We got a guard next to him. We got the Wipala flag in the back of indigenous liberation. Uh, give us a breakdown. Where was this and, and how'd you feel at that moment? Yeah, no, no. I felt like I, that was a good picture right there. They they caught it really good because I, I didn't even plan for that Wipala to be in the background. That's and fresh. Like how, and look how my man is, is like carrying the Wipala. It's like, <laughs> it looked like he, he was posing the Wipala for me, you know? Right, exactly. Um, but yeah, this was in the Cuartel de la Montaña, um, in the uh, the neighborhood of 23 de Enero, uh, 20, 23rd of uh, uh, January. Uh, this is where Chavez's remains are. This is where his tomb is, in this uh, military barrack. Uh, it's very famous because this, is, this was the military barrack where him and his comrades on February 4th, 1992, tried to do a um, operation to try to seize the barrack. Just the way that Fidel Castro tried to do with the uh, Cuartel de, de, de Moncada over there in Santiago de Cuba, but they failed and that's where uh, Chavez uh, went, to, went to prison uh, for, for six years. But the, the, it, was a, it was a very, um, this, is the, this is the barrack where uh, basically where the rebel, where he became famous, where people found like uh, knew who he was, and all this this whole rebellion that happened in uh, February fourth of nineteen ninety two was into was in reaction towards another rebellion, an anti neoliberalist rebellion known as the Caracaso, that happened in nineteen eighty nine in Caracas. That it was in reaction towards austerity measures, neoliberal policies that were forced under the Carlos Andres Perez uh, regime administration um, and and that uh, he unleashed the military against the people and killed over 3,000 people. Mind you, Chavez at this time was a military officer but didn't participate in this because he signed up and like to be part of the military to defend his people, not to not to kill his people. So um, this right here, this 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 was a this was an honor to be in this um in this space in the, in this in this um barrack and just given the fact that like the type of influence chavez has been in my life like because of because of chavez i was able to understand like the history of latin america and understand bolivar and be self-determined within these like i mean i might be a little bit i might be i might get a little bit personal but this is important yeah go for it because when you're when you're born in the united states when you're born in the empire you're born within this racial hierarchy and this white supremacist hierarchy. And for me, I feel like, you know, Comandante Chavez was able to make me understand my history and make me understand that I don't, like, we, we don't, we, we're not minorities. We are the majority and we have a history to be proud of, whether it's our indigenous roots, whether it's our African roots, or whether also it's Simon Bolivar. So the, this, this type of, um, this type of connection of history because of Commander Hugo Chavez helped me be self-determined within these institutions, these white supremacist institutions within this wilderness that we call the United States. So for me, it was it was it was a it was a um, it was a grand honor, and I, I you know I, I would be lying if I said I didn't crack a tear or like a couple of tears when I was in there. <laughs> it was That's a very so emotional cool. moment. No, I could imagine, and it's beautiful to be in that sort of environment you have reverence for a hero. Actually, it's funny because in 2019, me and my girlfriend Ophelia, when we were in China, we got to see Mao's body the, in the mausoleum in Beijing. 
And the same thing for us, it was very emotional. It was a beautiful experience seeing somebody who we've learned from and have studied and take inspiration from for resisting empire, resisting imperialism. And it's a beautiful moment when you're there. And, it, and, and it's a shame, right? Because people in, in mainstream media in the West will say, oh my God, people are so brainwashed because they're crying for this person, they're forcing them. And they don't understand that us as revolutionaries, as, as communists, as anti-imperialists, we don't idolize celebrities. We don't idolize these IG stars. Our heroes are, are Chavez and Sandino and Che and, and Mao. And, you know, and, and we get emotional and, and happy to see our heroes in person. And so this is another dope pick of the, we should just start like an album, you know, with, with all these pictures. This is a, this is really dope. Um, who's the guy in the background? And tell us a little bit of, it seems like it's like a, is that like a civilian guard? Like a Bolivarian c civilian guard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that right there is uh, one of the Minicianos, the, the militia man. Okay. The, the Bolivarian militia. Um, yeah, tell us about that. That was a, that was a, um, an initiative that Chavez implanted amongst the Venezuelan people after the coup, after the, the, the right wingers, the, the Venezuelan opposition uh, organized the coup with the United States under the uh, Bush, George W. Bush administration in 2002, which they failed, which the, the coup flopped. And it was historic, too, because um, like in the history of history, coup d'etats have never been reversed. U.S. backed coups have never been reversed. And the Venezuelan people were able to reverse that coup and get their president back into power, get Chavez back into power. And given the fact that that happened, Chavez knew that he needed to create a people's militia, a people's army in order to defend the revolution. So the guy in the back is, is a, a miliciano that he's, he's a guard for that, for the um, barrack, for that military barrack. That's what's up, that's what's up. Uh, yeah, it's really cool to see that and to see the mobilization of the people to see how the Bolivarian revolution doesn't allow people to sit by and stay homeless and stay without services. Everybody is employed, everybody's guaranteed to a job and, and services. And somebody like this guy in the back who's there taking care of the monument. I mean, how sick of a job, how cool would that be to be able to guard Chavez's monument? I think that's yeah. really dope, you know? I also, I also wanna say this too, they, they might look militant, but like you know, for me, I just feel like the the like the the people in uniform in Venezuela, they might be serious, they might be militant, but they also got like heart. Like they also have like there's like a human element towards them. Because yeah. I remember like when we were in the in the barrack, uh, people were passing around. I thought we were only be able to pass around like the the barrack, the the the, the tomb, like once, and I saw people passing it around, passing around like three times. And I remember I was trying to pass around a third time, and this lady was like, "No, you can't do that because it's a sacred, this is a sacred uh, barrack and all this other stuff." And I remember I was just like, "I, I respect you, you know, I understand that I gotta yeah. respect the, the tomb of Comandante, and I'm gonna tell you that you know he means a lot to me." I remember when I told him when I when I was like, "Oh, I, when um when I said I could tell you what he means to me," that's when I broke down. I couldn't help it. Like I was like, "Ah, oh, man, I was breaking down in front of her," you know. And yeah. she was just letting, oh, you could go, you could go, you know? And then after that, she wanted to take a picture of me. Cause I told, I told her the same thing about like, you know, being raised in the United States in this like white supremacist society and having like a figure like Chavez give you this sense of self-determination, you know, in this type, in, in this type of society. So she was like moved by my, my, my story and my words. That's why I was going to say like, you know, they, they might be like that, like very militant, yeah. but they, didn't, they have like this this tenderness. That's what I was looking for. Como este, car, este cariño, este ternura, you yeah. know, with, 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 with the people. I also wanted to, I know we, we have to move on to the next thing, but I just wanted to say that um, it was also impressive to see like the international people showing mad love to Chavez. Like I didn't, I forgot to mention this, that there was like the, this bunch of like, like Africans. I don't know if they were from the Congo or Zimbabwe, but they got in a line around the tomb and they were singing like this chant, this African song and repeating Chavez's name. You know, I was like, damn. That's what's it's up. So, it's so powerful to see like how Chavez is, he touches people, not just in the empire, but world, worldwide. 
No, definitely. I mean, he he was a, a a brilliant internationalist revolutionary who took the time because a lot of times communist revolutionaries will know a lot about their own nation or their own country, but Chavez was somebody who took the time and the consideration to learn about other people's struggle, Palestine, you know, all all over Latin America and the Caribbean. I remember in 2009 when the coup happened against uh, Manuel Zelaya in Honduras, and that, that was around the time that I was getting political. Mainstream media, all of mainstream media was praising the coup. They were like, we're getting rid of this tyrant, Zelaya. Chavez was the only one to get on on TV who was giving a voice to defend Zelaya. And I remember I was like, wow, that's really cool. And learning about Chavez and his internationalism is really beautiful to learn about. And connected with what you mentioned about comrades from Africa, a big deal mentioned happy birthday to Patrice Lumumba. That's what's up. Yeah, Patrice Lumumba is somebody who is of great inspiration to all Latin American and Caribbean revolutionaries, Che Guevara as well, a huge role. In the intro actually of the stream, Che Guevara cites Patrice Lumumba as one of his inspirations. And he cont his legacy continues to inspire people in Venezuela. And uh, also uh, uh, comrade Erica mentioned as well that the soldiers in, in Venezuela don't, all, don't look, um, hold on, I think it was somebody else actually that's, yeah, Tosco said they're not full of steroids like the American soldiers. <laughs> and talking about the Venezuelan soldiers. Yeah, that's exactly right. They're just regular, everyday working class people, pretty chill, defending the revolution, defending their people. And it's just beautiful to see that. And, it, you know, in talking about internationalism and in talking about proletarian unity across the world, this is other picture that you sent me that I thought was pretty beautiful of comrades from a few different countries. For those of you who are listening to this, uh, we have a group of comrades at this conference. Uh, somebody's having somebody has a Peru flag, where Pedro Castillo, a indigenous socialist, just became president. They're trying, as we speak, to get rid of him in a electoral coup against uh, Keiko Fujimori. And we have also the flag of Brazil, where the people are resisting Jair Bolsonaro, a Zionist, a fascist, somebody who bends over backwards for U.S. imperialism the flag of Argentina, um, the flag of Bolivia, and the flag of Guatemala. So you have people from all over. Tell us about the international nature. What countries did people come from? What were some of the experiences you had with international guests at the conference? Yeah, so the picture that you're seeing here is uh, basically like um, a meeting, like a separate meeting from, from the Congress, happened within the Congress, but like at a different time, uh, like different time schedule. Uh, these were youth, like different youth of uh, different countries in Latin America that wanted to come together and conversate and figure out, figure out how they could create unity amongst themselves as youth. Um, there was a uh, youth from Bolivia, as you see, Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Ecuador, uh, Uruguay. We had a, we had a comrade from IT and me, I mean, um, I'm like, consider myself Colombian, but I come from the United States. So, you know, I felt like oh, I had to rep the, the youth out in the U.S. And I mean, the, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's, there's revolutionaries within the empire too, which, and youth also, which we need to connect with the revolutionary youth of Latin America. So uh, we all came together. We were all figuring out how we can come up with proposals to show solidarity with each other and with each other's struggles. Um, as far as that, as far as the, the Congress, yeah, there was like di different nation states there, different people from around the world, whether it was people from the Congo, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Morocco, Romania, uh, the Basque region of Spain, uh, Catalonia. Uh, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, I'm trying to think who else outside of Latin America, because there's a lot of Latin American like nations there. Palestine. We have people from Palestine, Syria, Lebanon. Um, there was there was there was quite a few peoples there. Uh, so yeah, like Congo. I already said Congo, but as far as like Latin American nations, yeah, you had like Argentinians there. You had a lot of Bolivians there, a lot of Dominicans, a lot of Haitians, Ecuadorians, Peruvians, uh, Guatemalans, Salvadorians, 
and it was very cool to build with them. Like I remember building with uh, Bolivians and Ecuadorians and them telling me that they, they believe that is the father of the homeland. And it was very interesting because a lot of them would be, a lot of them would have like indigenous type of background and they would say that they would invoke Bolivar. So I found that like very like empowering, powerful. I also met with a lot of like leaders from different social movements in, in Latin America, whether it was Jaime Vargas of Conai in Ecuador, that's, a, that's an indigenous organization or uh, Evo Morales. I mean, I'm probably gonna show the picture. Oh, the 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 ex uh, indigenous president of Bolivia that was ousted by a U.S. backed coup, but was able to uh, his people were able to regain the democracy a year later with the elections, making the OAS look very horribly and bad in the international stage. And I got to meet also uh, this Afro-Colombian woman named Piedad Cordoba. It was a great honor, given the fact that what she's had to confront. Uh, how she's had to confront the Uribe regime, uh, and I also have a, who else I met. I also met Chavez's brother, I Idan Chavez, who's a professor. I got to see Diosdado Cabello, who's a very very powerful revolutionary. Like they say that he's actually the true inheritor of the the Bolivarian Revolution. Even though I I, I like Maduro too. Um, and uh, I got to meet also the, the son of one of my favorite Latin American folk singers, uh, Ali Primera, and his, his name is Sandino Primera, named after the, the Sandinista revolution. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, like, like, like I said again, it, it showed about how much Venezuela is really the epicenter of the anti-imperialist, anti-colonial struggle. Oh, there's the, there's, there's the picture right there. Um, but before we get into that picture, I was gonna just say that they had like a whole program of trying to get people to conversate with each other. What they, they called the mesas, like different com, like different rooms of conversation, whether it had to do with political party, whether it had to do with youth, whether it had to do with Afro descendants, indigenous, campesinos, uh, farmers. So it shows about how Venezuela really is trying to bring popular movements from around the world, different popular movements to, to come together and to unify with each other for this popular front against imperialism. Yeah, definitely. And we're looking at the image of uh, Yamir with uh, Sandino Primera. Ali Primera is one of my favorite revolutionary artists and singers. If, for those of you watching and listening, if you haven't already, check out Ali Primera's music. He has some really beautiful music, as well as Los Guaraguao, another band from Venezuela that has songs like Casas del Cartón, Perdóname Tia Juan, Abre Brecha, and just so many beautiful songs. And he named his son Sandino Primera in solidarity with the Sandinista revolution. And Ali Primera is also very popular in El Salvador because of his tours and concerts for the FMLN in solidarity with the Salvadoran uh, guerrilla movement in the 80s. And it's just cool to see like that level of solidarity and camaraderie. I mean, it's it's something that a lot of times like in the West is is so missing, right? Because here's a picture of you with the homie Danny and Evo, the homie Evo Morales right here. Damn, Evo's pretty tall. I didn't I didn't realize how tall Evo is. I'm I'm kind of also like slouching a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about this picture. How how did you feel at that moment getting to meet Evo? Oh Morales? man. That was so cool. Like I remember, I was at the dinner table with with, with uh, Danny, yeah, uh, and the ho the the homegirl right there. That she's part of DSA. Okay, and I was just like, "Yo, we gotta try to like take a picture with Evo. Let's 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 try to do it as a team. Let's try to say, oh, with the U.S. delegation, and we want to take a picture with with Evo Morales because um it we it was it, it was at dinner, and Evo Morales." came downstairs to eat dinner with everybody, but he, he had security with him, of course. Um, he's, a, he's a very important figure. And you had a lot of these like sisters, like indigenous Guatemalan sisters or indigenous Colombian sisters that wanted to take a picture with him. And you had to be a little bit like, you had to move, you know? So I was just like, ah, right, we gotta move like a unit. And we were able to take a picture with Evo. And it was just, oh man, it was such a dope moment. Like I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. That's what's up. Evo somebody who, I mean, I don't drink anymore. I used to drink, but when I did drink, Evo somebody who I'd like to have a beer with and just chill. He looks so approachable, so down to earth. And 
I remember if you haven't, for those of you watching and listening, if you haven't seen, there's this documentary called Cocalero. It's really good. It's about Evo Morales and his rise in the social movements of Bolivia with the coca farmers. Such a beautiful lifestyle and just a humble dude, man. Like he's somebody who is approachable, chill. And it's really cool that you got to chill with him like that. Uh, shout out to, by the way, to uh, Compañera Debra Rodriguez, to Isai, uh, to Altruman Service, who said, uh, Ramiro and Erica, you two have great passion and empathy for the people. This says a lot for Hugo Chavez, who is obviously cut from the same cloth. Much respect. I appreciate that, Comrade Altruman Service. I don't, I don't think I'll ever be as close to what Chavez is, but I hope to work along his path and continue to do some of the work that he does. I mean, just such an inspiration. Erica says, OAS needs to get out of, the, out of Haiti's business. Yes, indeed. And that's always been one of my criticisms of uh, the Latin American left is the lack of solidarity. I mean, I don't want to say overall people don't, people like Venezuela shows mad solidarity and love, Cuba and Nicaragua for Haiti. But within the Latin American left, there is people tend to forget about Haiti and Haiti is not only the, the most impoverished country in the Western hemisphere because of what reparations, colonialism and imperialism, but it's also the first revolution, 1804, you know, Toussaint and Dessalines, they inspired Bolivar, they inspired all these independent movement. Without Haiti and the Haitian revolution, there would be no modern day Latin America. We'd probably still be under the Spanish empire, who the fuck knows, you know? And, and so that's something that I think within the Latin American left, I'm glad uh, Comrade Erica mentioned that because Haiti, we need to support Haiti. You know, they are on the forefront of resistance of imperialism. And it's just something beautiful to to see that level of solidarity. There's this other pick that, um, that I wanna show. Um, before I get into pulling up the next pick, what, how was the reaction from other people that you were there with? Like, w did anybody have any anecdotes or stories about like just feeling overpowered and, and emotional? Did you go by yourself, by the way, or, or did you go with other people? Um, no, I, I, I went by myself, but I just I met up with with different people. Like I, I knew I knew different people that were going to go to the to the Congress. But I, I, I yeah, I got, I got there by myself. That's what's up. I know, like, if, if I would have gone, it would have been, oh, man, I would have had such a great time. I still haven't gone to Venezuela. I hope to someday. And it's something that, you know, I hope to really learn and experience. Tosco said, I feel like Caribbean countries are looked down by mainland Latino countries. I got to agree with you, comrade. I, unfortunately, that's something that as as Latin American communists, as revolutionaries, we we have to fight against the anti blackness, anti-indigenousness. That's why for me, Evo as well is so inspiring because somebody like Evo, who's indigenous, who has been hurled with so many racist comments to stand up with dignity, with pride, it, you know, is something so beautiful. There's this other uh, picture that I wanted to show you. I, I thought it was really interesting, uh, comrade Yamid, that you took, um, we can maybe talk about not only your experience in Venezuela. So we're seeing, for those of you who are listening, this is the Escudo, the logo of the National Police, the Policia Nacional Bolivariana, the National Bolivarian Police of Venezuela. Now, for us as, as Bolivarian supporters, as Chavistas, as communists, we defend the Bolivarian police. We defend the armed forces of Venezuela against imperialism. We support our troops. Our, my troops are Venezuelan troops. My police are Venezuelan police. Same with Cuba, same with Nicaragua, etc. Now, to say that in some circles in the left, in the US, people would be like, oh, how dare you? You know, ACAB, all cops, don't you know that all cops are bastards? What is the difference between police in leftist and liberated Latin American countries like Venezuela, also like Nicaragua? We had a, a interesting experience that when we were in Nicaragua that you had some interactions with police there um, and maybe in Cuba as well. What is the difference between police in, in socialist countries, countries that are liberating themselves from the empire versus police in the US and in, in New York, where you're at right now, where they're killing black and brown people. Yeah, I mean, from my experience, going to a lot of these socialist countries that still have like these police units, um, it's kind of, it's always been like a little bit of hard or like a tricky thing to like really fathom because coming from empire and 
you know, being part of like a lot of BL BLM rallies and anti-police brutality rallies, it's, it's kind of hard to think about that there could be another form of organizing the police or that the police could be truly on the people's side. Uh, I remember being in Nicaragua and I remember being in the, the, the rural uh, town of Quinotega and talking to a, a cop and him telling me that um, he gets voted in by his own people. Like, basically, like, it's not like here where um, the people who are policing a certain neighborhood are not from that neighborhood at times or most times. And he, I also spoke to the cop in Nicaragua and, and told him about like what happened to George Floyd. And he said that that, that would never happen in Nicaragua, um, that, that, that type of discrimination. Uh, same thing in Venezuela too. I mean, I remember speaking to a Venezuelan cop and we, we had a little bit of a conversation about policing in Venezuela. And uh, it was a cop, it was a woman cop too. And she told me that uh, basically in, in Venezuela, they don't have, they, the citizenry are more defended like their rights are more defended than the cops. It's not like here where the state defend the cops more than the citizenry. Um, to, to, to simplify it, basically the, the cops in Venezuela have a lot, have a high chance of losing their jobs if they violate the citizenry. It's not like here where it's like, you know, somebody, uh, somebody chokes out somebody, some, like somebody kills somebody, chokes them out on video, and then you have to have a massive uprising in order for this person to get a trial and luckily get get in prison, so there's there's you see there's, there's a there's a big time difference, and that is not to say that there's no corruption either, but you see that there's a different way of how the how policing gets policing gets handled in Venezuela, in 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 comparison to the United States. Yeah, most definitely. I think that's the. Marxist and correct approach to understanding the nature of police, the Leninist understanding, because that's where our differences are with some of the ultras and the anarchists, because the anarchists and the ultras, for them, all coercion is bad. All states are bad. All police are bad. For them, the origin of the problems of repression and capitalism stem from the state, whereas as communists, as Marxists, we understand that the state is not a being in upon itself. A state doesn't think. It's not a physical being. It's not a living and breathing organism. The state is an instrument, an inanimate object, right? A tool that is used by one class to suppress another class. This is where we go back to Lenin, State and Revolution, where he talks about the state where the working class in a revolution, in a socialist revolution, should seize the state and use the state as an instrument to suppress the oppressed class, and in countries like Venezuela, and countries like Nicaragua, Cuba, and in, in, in China, in the Soviet Union, where socialism has been constructed or where it's being built, because socialism, the class struggle continues, right? Under as you're building socialism, as it is in, in Venezuela today, there's still a struggle going on against the squalidos, the rich, the the U.S. traders who are trying to sabotage. And so those forces, the police, the armed forces, they're used in defense of the working class people against the bourgeoisie to continue to advance the revolution. It's not, it's not like on day one, you could just snap your fingers and police are gone, right? You have to use them, use that tool, liberate the police institutions and use it against the oppressing class. And I think that's such a great breakdown. And, and I think your anecdotes were exactly right because you explain like the real difference between um, the state in a capitalist, imperialist country versus a state in a, in a liberated country like our Venezuela, Cuba, or, or Nicaragua, or Bolivia. Um, we just have a few minutes left, comrade. Uh, sh by the way, shout out to, before we get into this picture, uh, shout out to comrade Tosco, shout out to Big Teal. Uh, Big Teal said, uh, South Com is the U.S. police of Latin America. That's exactly right. Uh, Erica said, this is why I push back so hard against ACAB and the conflation that is made with community control of the police, which is basically dictatorship of the proletariat. Exactly right. And um, comrade uh, Howard Sadana talking about indigenous revolution and liberation. All the shout out to everybody that's watching, listening, by the way. I love talking with uh, the homie Yamir because I think he's one of the few communists and leftists that I can have a conversation with and it doesn't 
spiral into a purity spiral of like, oh, that person's not good enough, you know, this person. <laughs> and he understands like very tactfully and, and practically why we defend people like Bolivar, why we defend people like Marx, who are not perfect, who have their flaws, but uh, are liberating their people more or less. So this last picture, I just want to show everybody, for those of you who are watching and listening, uh, this is a picture of Yamir at a statue, a bust of Hugo Chavez with some beautiful high-rise apartments in the background with cars. This, I mean, I look at this picture, man, and this, to me, this looks like Park Avenue, like New York. You know, this looks like a very beautiful area. But um, for a lot of what you got to visit, one of the big accomplishments of Venezuela is its housing projects for working class people. Everyone has access somewhere to live. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the housing developments in Venezuela and, and how that's part of the Bolivarian revolution. So, yeah, so that picture right there is in the housing mission of Ciudad Tuna that I got to visit on my last day in Venezuela. And it was just so beautiful to witness that and to see it because it made me really understand more the Bolivarian revolution uh, as far as their achievements in um, making sure that they're providing housing to, towards their population. As, as I think about it, I really didn't see that much homelessness in, in Venezuela. Um, and I, I'm really, I, it's really hard for me to really recall that. Like in comparison in New York City to a city that I come from or over there in, in, in LA, that there, there's, you, you see homeless people out in the streets and yep. you, see these type of, you see these type of buildings and people know that these type of buildings are like, as a sign of gentrification. Right then and there, like if you see this in the hood, out in in the South Bronx or in East New York, you already know that like this is the first step towards gentrification, and these buildings are not for the working class; it's more for the affluent class. But here in Venezuela, is very different. These type of buildings, and these, and also to add, these buildings were built by the Chinese, like um, like the same type of architecture and everything. Right. Um, these buildings are for the working class. These buildings are for the poor out in Venezuela. And also they're not politicized. Like you could either be Chavista or you could be opposition and you're able to sign up for these uh, housing complexes. And also like, um, yeah, the fact of how they're, they're organized within these housings. Like they have a, a clinic out there. They have a clinic full of uh, Cuban doctors that are giving the vaccine to the people within these housings and also the people within these housings that are pro uh, revolution, pro government are also the ones that would say that they're, they're always in the front lines to defend the Bolivarian revolution. And it, it, and it, it's, it goes to show because of the fact that the Bolivarian revolution gave them this housing and gave them access to this health care. So, so, yeah. so yeah. That's what's up, man. I mean, it's wow. These these buildings are beautiful, and just like you said, like right now, I'm in East LA, and LA in general, dude. Like, there's so much homelessness, unhoused people, tent cities popping up. Like, it's crazy the amount because of capitalism. We have literally in my neighborhood where I'm at right now, you have so many empty homes, and just a few blocks away, you have thousands of people outside with no houses, just the irrationality of capitalist, the market, right? Let the free market decide, you know, and it, it's just like, this shows that when you have people in housing, everyone deserves a right to, to a, a low cost housing or free housing. And it's beautiful to see. And especially that's really interesting that you say that it's built, helped built by the Chinese because within the left, man, I mean, I can't tell you how many people are like Chinese imperialism, you know, the debt trap and, and China's helping Venezuela build these house, housing units like this for free or low cost, you know, and that that is what socialism is all about. Brotherhood, construct construction, uh, housing, feeding the people, serving the people. And yet in articles by the Wall Street Journal, or the New York Times, you're going to say, oh, China's, you know, manipulating Venezuela and they're building them houses and look what they're doing. This is, quote unquote, Chinese imperialism, you know, housing the people. So I'm glad that you mentioned that because that's that's really interesting um, that, that you do mention that. But uh, oh, uh, comrade, yeah, what are you going to say? I was going to add one last thing. Also, yeah. this, this housing miss mission is one of the many achievements of this constitution right here of the mm. 1990. I got the little book. Well, I got the nice. little book and I got the, I got the bigger version of it. 
oh shit, that's what's up. But yeah, this is a, this is a little book that you'll see in like any documentary on Venezuela. Um, basically, yeah, this this housing mission was consolidated because of this Bolivarian Constitution that was enacted in 1992 after uh, Comandante Hugo Chavez becomes the president. His first his first term of of Venezuela, where this constitution puts forth the right to housing for the people. That's beautiful, man. I mean, I. Can you imagine in the U.S. doing that? Like that would be impossible. And and Erica had a great point. She said buildings are literally sinking in Miami, and look at what China is doing for Venezuela. I mean, just the irony of all these Miami gusanos and Esqualidos who are like, people are eating flamingos in Venezuela. People are dying. Venezuela is constructing high-rise apartments. They're trading with China. They're building supermarkets. Meanwhile, the infrastructure in Miami is literally fucking collapsing. You know. And also to keep in mind, all of this is happening under the intensity of sanctions of, of a black right. kid. Right. To keep that in mind, like also the fact that like that's one thing that I was so impressed by Venezuela about how their people are still like still moving forward with their revolutionary project, how they're still organizing in the popular barrios within their spaces and how they're still building the, these housing, like these housing complexes under intense blockade and under intense sanctions like what they call illegal unilateral coercive measures exactly dude i mean that's insane like just shout out to to venezuela our sisters and brothers in the bolivarian republic of venezuela it's such an inspiration for all oppressed working class people around the world for all people struggling against imperialism that's why we have to stay in solidarity and defense with our people in venezuela because since 1999, since they decided to liberate themselves from imperialism, they've been attacked every single day, even though it doesn't seem like it, they've been attacked every single day, every hour with sanctions, with media attacks. For every one positive story, there's 20 or 30 horrible stories against Venezuela. Uh, compañero Yamil, before we wrap up, I know one thing, first of all, I just wanna say thanks for, for joining me, man. I'm, it's always, Really dope talking to you. Um, how can people follow you and support you? Uh, what do you have next coming up that you want to work on? Um, I, I know maybe something that we talked about is maybe even you starting a channel and just producing some content. Because, like, dude, all of these pictures and videos, like, this is beautiful stuff that the world needs to see and hear about. Um, and so how can people follow you and support you? So, yeah, um, right now... Uh, I just created a YouTube page called the Bolivarian Flame, uh, okay. very inspired by uh, this this flame, this big torch that I saw in the Cuartel de la Montaña where Comandante uh, Chavez remains are, his tomb. Uh, so uh, yeah, I just created that uh, YouTube page called the, the Bolivarian Flame where I plan to post more of my videos, uh, also my, my interviews that I've done in, in Venezuela and also in Nicaragua as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, you could just follow me also at my my my, my name Yamir Chabur on Instagram and, and Facebook because I'm always posting about my my travels and my journeys and all all, the, all my interviews. No doubt, comrade. So make sure everybody who's watching, listening, please subscribe to his channel. I'll put the link as well in the description. Bolivarian Flame. That's a that's a dope ass name, by the way, for in solidarity with the Venezuelan Revolution, Cuban, Nicaraguan. And it's something that transcends borders. It's internationalist, it's Latin American, and uh, overall it's a dope name. Uh, Comrade Yamida, it's really dope talking to you, bro. Um, I'm gonna head out, I'm gonna have some uh, dinner with my girlfriend, Ophelia. We're gonna go We're gonna go get some Korean barbecue. That's my favorite dinner to get on Fridays. What, what are you up to this weekend? Are you gonna start this- 4th of July? <laughs> oh, no, 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 that, that holiday. <laughs> Ah oh, man, I'm on, I'm planning a barbecue, and I wonder what I'm gonna burn that day. The U- U.S. flag, get your U.S. flags. <laughs> yeah, get, get, get ready for that parrilla with the U.S. flag. Exactly, carne asada parrilla with the U.S. flag uh, kicking. Yeah, I mean, get ready yeah, for the, the, the Fourth of a lie. The Fourth of a lie. That's exactly right, comrade. I miss. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I'm out here in L.A. Fourth of July. The the cool thing about here is fireworks and people will turn up. New York. Fourth of July, obviously not for the U.S. patriotism and bullshit, but New York is mad lit in the summer. We have that Gran Combo song, Un Verano Nueva York. 
And uh, every time I listen to that song, it reminds me of New York, and I'm like, damn, I'm gonna go back someday. Um, but yo, I hope you enjoy, it, brother. Is I can tell you, I can tell you what I'm gonna do the next day, the fifth yeah. of July, because the fifth yeah. of July is Venezuelan Independence. Nice. The, That's what's up. the, the next day is like from from the wow. so-called independence of imperialism to the right. so-called independence of the country that's given the the fight against imperialism the epicenter right now of the exactly. anti-colonial struggle the real the real revolutionary holiday well stuff comrade everybody please subscribe boulevard and flame link is in the description peace out comrade it was so dope talking to you and uh, have a great weekend all right all right viva chavez viva, viva chavez viva. 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 Viva.